Hello and welcome to today's webinar presented by Vicente Cedarberg LLP. My name is Jeff Welsh and I'll be your moderator for today. Today's webinar is going to be focused on East Coast versus West Coast licensing, the similarities, the differences, and some lessons learned. Hopefully we'll have some time at the end of the webinar to take some Q&A from everyone in attendance. Thank you for joining if you're here. I'm really excited to be joined by some of my exceptional colleagues who are across the country. Um, happy to welcome Jennifer Cabrera, who will be representing New Jersey and New York. Tim Callahan and David Yulian, who will be our experts on Massachusetts, and Amanda Kilrow and Emily Hackman, who will be representing California. Um, before we sort of dive into um, the, the sort of meat and potatoes of this webinar, really wanted to provide everyone with a general overview um, of these states individually. Um, so let's get started with the East Coast um, here. Um, Jen, if you wouldn't mind, you know, giving us a, a high level overview on the programs and the evolution of the programs to date in, in, in both uh, New York and New Jersey, that would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And um, I want to start out by um, saying hi to my dad, who always watches my webinar. Oh, so, hey, Dad. Hi, Victor Cabrera. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, so um, New York and New Jersey. Let's start with New Jersey because its medical program is older and it's a little farther along in the road to legalization. New Jersey legalized um, medical marijuana in 2010, but it had a really limited program for the first seven, eight years. Um, there are currently 12 alternative treatment centers known as ATCs in the state. They're all vertically integrated and they serve a patient population of about 100,000 folks, um, individuals. Um, in, earlier this year, the state legalized adult use and um, it's on the road to full adult use licensing coming later this year. For New York, it's also a medical marijuana state since 2014. There are 10 registered organizations in the state and um, it also passed adult use earlier this year. And it'll be a little bit longer lead time, but definitely an exciting time there. Fantastic, thank you so much, Jen. Um, let's move on to Massachusetts. Um, David and Tim, would you mind giving us an over here, uh, overview here, guys? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. So my name is David Yulian. I'm a senior associate attorney in the Boston office, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Tim Callahan, who's an expert on, on licensing as well. So here in Massachusetts, we have both medical and adult use. Um, medical passed um, by ballot initiative in 2012 with about 63 percent of the vote. Um, it was originally regulated by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, um, but that was eventually transitioned over to the current Cannabis Control Commission in 2018. Um, the first medical dispensaries opened up in June of 2015, um, and now there are, are about 71 operational medical marijuana treatment centers, uh, which are vertically integrated and, and still are, although that may be changing in the future. We also have about 95,000 um, active patients. Uh, in terms of adult use, uh, Massachusetts voters passed also by ballot initiative um, question four in 2016 with about 53% of the vote. Um, there are a number of different license types, but uh, the first adult use retail dispensary opened in November of 2018, and there are currently about 134 retail stores, 47 cultivation facilities, 43 product manufacturer facilities, and additional um, licenses, so um, becoming uh, operational um, every single month. So it's definitely uh, an expanding program, um, a lot of opportunities here. Um, it's not a competitive licensing process, so uh, as soon as you find a, a property and you uh, obtain the required local approvals, you can submit an application to the state um, and then go through the inspections processes um, before you can get up and running. So a lot of opportunities, a lot of license types, and, and a pretty pretty open licensing process. Fantastic, thank you so much, David. Um, last but not least, um, Amanda and Emily wanna speak a little about um, California and how we how we got to where we are. Take it away, Emily. Sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, there is a much longer history of cannabis in California than there are in, in Massachusetts and um, New York and New Jersey. Um, in California, you know, in 1996, we've, we've had medical cannabis. Um, the state decriminalized the cultivation and use of medical marijuana um, with a physician's recommendation, and that was called yep. the Compassionate Use Act. Um, jump forward about 20 years, 
<laughs> in 2015 and 2016, the state was working on um, a, you know, a, a larger framework to regulate medical cannabis. Um, and then in 2016, it's also, it's known as Proposition 64. We have adult medical, uh, or I'm sorry, adult cannabis passed um, by the voters in 2016 with 57% of the vote. So um, in 2017, we, you know, at that point we had these two sort of competing regulatory frameworks, one for adult and one for medical. And Governor Jerry Brown said, you know, this is just too much um, <laughs> complication of an industry where there's so much similarity. <laughs> so um, we actually he combined the two frameworks into one, and that's what we have now, and that's what's called MALCURSA, the Medical and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. MALCURSA established three different regulatory bodies, agencies, and the three agencies govern different license types. So we have Currently, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, which regulates retailers, distributors, testing labs, and micro businesses. Um, we have the Manufactured Cannabis Safety Branch, which regulates manufacturers. And we have Cal Cannabis, which regulates cultivators. Um, all three of these agencies have their own set of regulations. They are not aligned on every <laughs> aspect of the regulations. Conflicting often. <laughs> yes, which makes our job. Um, fun to say the least, <laughs> um, and it makes uh, operators. You know, it's, it's difficult to. Um, it can be difficult to sort of navigate the different regulations, especially if operators have various licenses with each of the agencies. Um, currently, the state agencies are undergoing a consolidation process, so hopefully, we're going to be simplifying the licensing process and the application requirements. Um, and this new department will be called the Department of Cannabis Control. So um, that'll be an exciting move in the next year, um, maybe even sooner. Um, and there's certainly a lot of um, uh, anticipation by industry and um, folk to see kind of where these, um, some of the differences in the regulations will yeah. come out. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so kind of next steps here, what we wanted to talk about first were sort of pieces of, you know, license applications that you're going to need um, to sort of figure out, um, re regardless of the state you're applying in. So we wanted to start with the similarities here um, and then, you know, next discuss some of the differences, you know, between um, these states specifically. So um, kind of the floor is open right now for everyone. Um, team, you know, let, let's talk about some of the similarities and, and un unpack those um, a bit for, for everyone in attendance um, so they can understand, you know, look, if you're looking to apply anywhere, wh what are kind of the basics? Yeah. Um, I can start. The, the one sure. that always comes to my my mind first is is the property requirement. You know, you have to have a place to set up shop. So, pretty sure that's going to be the same across the board. Um, and then, relatedly, there's also you know you have to secure the property. And in California, at least, you have to you know have a legal right to occupy. So, loca in localities can be different. Sometimes it's you know they they actually want to see the lease or the purchase. You know that you that you have the deed to the property. Um, and sometimes they just want to see like a, a one page affidavit saying from the property owner saying, you know, we, we are allowing this use. Um, I guess to continue down that path, there's also a premises diagram requirement. Right. So you actually have to show to secure the property, you have to have the legal right to occupy. And then you also have to tell them exactly what activities are taking place sort of in every every square foot of that property. Um, I don't know, you guys, is that, do you have, do you also have those same sort of, yeah, requirements in terms of right to occupy and, 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 and premises diagrams? Yeah, so at least in Massachusetts anyway, at the municipal level, it's going to vary from municipality to municipality, right. but of course you're going to need, you know, some kind of prop, uh, property interest documentation there. Um, every municipality that you intend to operate in, you have to have a host community agreement. Um, and so oh, that's, yeah. that's the, the case with, with California or something similar to that. Uh, but in terms of the process for getting a host community agreement from a municipality, that's going to vary from municipality to municipality. It's going to vary by license type as well that you're applying for. Um, so, you know, some processes might be more involved than others. Some might be you know more competitive than others as well. So, right. That's going to be kind of fact specific based upon municipality, uh, but certainly, um, yeah, property interest documentation, whether that's a lease or an LOI or a deed to the property, you're going to need. 
The, the host We're, community agreement is it, you think it's like a development agreement in California? Is it like if you let us operate, we'll do X, Y, and Z in your community kind of a thing, or is it more like a permit? Yeah, that's essentially what it is. It's an agreement between uh, the the licensee and and the municipality, and you know, sort of the the terms of how they're going to operate and if they're going to be giving you know a portion of you know the revenues back to the municipality. <laughs> any, always, like, local, that's always part of it. <laughs> yeah, any like local hiring standards, like that kind of thing as well. Um, and so that's, that's cool. like local permitting processes. If you're talking about like special permits or building permits and things along those lines as well. Great. Like, at least as far as New York, yeah. and New York, because the programs are just, we don't have <laughs> regulations in either state yet. Like there are no adult use licenses available. New Jersey's regulations will come out in August, New York's at some date to be determined, probably end of the year. But um, property control absolutely will be part of yeah. it. Does that mean that you need to actually own the property outright? Not necessarily, as long as you will have control of the property if your application is approved, um, that should suffice. Um, host community agreements, not um, not a possibility in New York, actually. The, the law pretty much forbids them um, or close to it. New Jersey, um, it, it is certainly a possibility and I think we're going to see a bit of that. Great. And just to just to add on to that, just a couple other things, uh, at least in Massachusetts, um, you mentioned in California, the, the premises diagram. That is definitely a, a requirement uh, to show a sort of a floor plan of your premises and where your security cameras might be, but mm -hmm. that is not actually required to be submitted to the state regulators until after you have a provisional license. So it's during what's called the architectural review phase, which you can always submit after you obtain a provisional oh. license rather than as part of the initial application. So a little bit of difference, but um, yeah. it's a similar type requirement, but definitely a, a little bit uh, farther down the line. Well, that's interesting though, because you would, I mean, one of the things that we run into, I guess this is probably a similarity across the board is, you know, clients having having concerns about basically investing a lot of time and money um, with no guarantee of approval. So I'm just surprised, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of happy that in California, the premises diagram comes first because I would hate for, you know, them to be like, oh, actually, we don't allow volatile extraction. And we see that that's in your, you know, something like that. So it's interesting that it comes later for, have you ever come across an issue like that where yeah. denied at a later date? So typically it's a, it's a fairly <laughs> standard process. They're really just sort of looking to see if you, you know, have okay. the, right, the, the right camera coverage or if you're a co-located facility. So if you were doing medical and adult use, there are certain requirements about having, you know, a special uh, consultation room for patients or a separate queue inside the retail dispensary for patients. So they're just sort of looking to see if you're meeting the, the basic regulatory requirements. But sometimes they'll ask for, you know, some additional information or some revised drawings. But uh, we haven't really seen a lot of kind of rejections um, of that in that part of the phase. It's more of a, yeah. sort of a necessary but not a, uh, a barrier type of I would say that's, you know, true at the state level as far as like moving forward with architectural review and that kind of thing. You know, the municipal level in terms of whatever permitting requirements are there, you might run into some issues if you have plans that are specific that aren't necessarily on board with whatever the local zoning bylaws dictate. Sure. And so we've seen people who have, you know, moved forward with, uh, you know, application processes at the state and then, you know, kind of run into issues at the local permitting process, whether that's getting a special permit or a building permit uh, later down the road when they're actually starting to get ready to, like, build out the facility, certainly. Yeah. Great. There's um, a question. Go ahead, Jen. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I saw a question in the chat about whether we expect host community agreements to change in New York. Mm -hmm. um, like, it may just make sense to sort of address that issue head on. Sure. Um, <laughs> in New York, some municipalities can't, uh, they can't actually require any local licensing, period. So it's only state level licensing. Municipalities can opt out or, and they can also control time, place and manner for retail licenses and consumption lounges. They can't do it for cultivation or manufacturing, period. So you certainly won't see any, like, I don't even know if they can require site approval. We're just going to have to see what um, the regulations say for cultivation. For retail, like, I think they're, you're, it's very 
likely you'll require site approval, but like community host agreements, I, I don't think so. It seems really like not the direction the state's going in, but and town, there are over a thousand towns in this very large state. Like some will probably try it and we'll just see how it goes, but that's not the intention. So the, so the localities don't have any say over, over it at all? Over cultivation and manufacturing, right? I mean, it sounds implausible. Like they can't yeah. <laughs> even regulate time, place or manner. So does that yeah. mean they can be like located like in the middle of a residential zone? Yeah. No, presumably the regulations will specify what zoning is appropriate, but like, will that then be true across the state? We just don't know how that will work. Yeah, that's tough. But that's an issue that we've come across in California too, where, you know, especially for cultivation, um, the, the regs that work in Southern California do not work in Northern California. You know, there's like, what was it, the security guard requirement or something? And some Northern California guy was like, I have 400 acres of land. Like, <laughs> you want this guy patrolling? <laughs> you know, so yeah, that's yeah. that's a really interesting point. Awesome. It's true. Well, guys, let's also touch real quickly. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Um, just on general corporate documents, right? Like, yeah. tell us what tell us what a client, you know, people tuning in, tell us what they're going to need on sort of the corporate, you know, side to just make sure those boxes are checked. You got this. <laughs> uh, sure. So, um, you know, you're going to need your your sort of basic corporate information documents, mm -hmm. and that depends, of course, on the different entity that you have um, and the different regulatory agencies in California find owner differently and um, as, and they sort of interpret their regulations. Um, you know, the Bureau is the most, the Bureau of Cannabis Control is the most um, strict in terms of ownership and they are looking not just on the owners of the applicant, but if the applicant entity has yeah. entity owners, they're looking through. So, um, it, it can be a very cumbersome process if you have a complex corporate structure because the state agencies do want to know who are the actual owners of these businesses the down people, to yeah. the individual level. So, Emily, that's a great that's a great point. I'm curious, you know, uh, David, Tim, Jen, um, if, if we know, you know, California's requirements, right? It's, it's sort of this magical 20 percent threshold in, in California <laughs> that if you're profit sharing or have, uh, you know, an equity ownership of over 20 percent, you're defined as a non-equity owner in California. Less than that is, uh, you know, you're defined as a financial interest holder. The, that threshold sort of changes um changes what type of disclosure and, and the detail of that disclosure. Are, are, are there any similar um, disclosure mechanisms like that yeah. in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York? Sure. Tell I us. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> so I, I can I can weigh in on Massachusetts. So we have this notion of a person or entity having direct or indirect control. It's a it's a it's a term that's evolved over wow. the years, and there's a number of different criteria that could constitute constitute control. Um, one of those prongs is a direct or indirect ownership percentage of ten percent um, okay. in the licensed entity. So. And that would apply to both directly in the license entity and any kind of all the way up through any sort of a parent company. Um, this is something that really has evolved over the years. It's been a, a source of a lot of confusion for a lot of people over the years. And um, we've been sort of trying to get additional clarification on exactly who would, who would count and who would not count. Um, so it, it is definitely something that we're continuing to try to wrap our head around. Um, I, I'm hoping that the mission will publish some guidance any day now that will help to clear up some of these things. Um, but the the magic number for ownership is 10%, um, regardless if it's sort of directly or indirectly through a, through a parent. Yeah, and certainly we always try to encourage clients to like closely review whatever corporate documents they have, bylaws, operating agreements, shareholders agreements, so on and so forth, to make sure they're making the adequate disclosures on their application. Uh, so representations of the commission about who ultimately owns the entity uh, that leads to you know disclosure issues down the line potentially uh, or you know some enforcement actions as well that we've seen uh, I think probably as a whole the commission has done a much better job uh, especially with this most recent round of regulations as far as like more clearly defining exactly what those ownership prongs are 
Um, but you know, before making any disclosures to the commission, it's you know, hugely important that people familiarize with themselves with those disclosure requirements. Fantastic. Uh, Jen, any, any insight um, on those requirements yet um, for Jersey or, or New York? Yeah, they're largely staying the same from what they've been under the medical programs. In New gotcha. Jersey, it's a 5% threshold, honestly, for being what's called a significantly involved person. So if you have like a ownership interest over 5%, um, or if you're uh, uh, someone with decision-making authority, you need to be disclosed and undergo a background check. And then also that is the obviously the, the important factor in deciding whether your you know, company or an individual is violating the cross ownership restrictions, because there's a ban on vertical integration for the first two years of the adult use program. So that'll expire in February of 2023. Um, and that also gets into whether you have too many of a certain license type, because you can only hold one of any given license type in the state. In New York, it's a 10% threshold, um, and that is going to carry over into the adult use program. Also, there is that ban on vertical integration, and basically anyone with 10% or more needs to be disclosed to the Department of Health. In the future, it's going to be a different regulator. It'll be the Office of Cannabis Management, um, and they want to um, have those folks undergo a background check and so forth. Then sure. what's the rationale but behind banning vertical and vertical integration? Is it like we don't want big operate? You know, we want to keep. It seems. I think that's the idea. Is they want to make sure that they're developing like a, a local industry. Or that that's yeah. the concept. New Jersey also has a ban on um, a cap on the number of cultivators for the first two years. Thirty-seven cultivators, which is a big problem if you're worried about supply which they are. Um, <laughs> there is no cap on the number of micro business cultivators, but there are a lot of restrictions on that license type. Uh, so yeah. I, I think, yeah, with New Jersey, there may be a bit of a case of over regulation in the or, or originating law. And that's a little tough for the commission as they try to come up with, with regulations, but they're trying to develop their own in, uh, local industries and encourage local producers to come in. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just real quick here, uh, a couple questions were answered actually organically, which is always great. Um, Heather Sullivan, um, you know, we kind of covered ownership differences um, and license caps in the beginning. Um, so if you have additional questions there, just reach out to sort of the appropriate person. We're going to be providing, um, you know, emails um, at the end of this and you can find us on our website. Um, but we just went over that. Uh, Nico uh, Seku, I really quickly you had a question about distribution to New York from other states. Keep in mind, cannabis is still federally illegal, right? No, no crossing state lines with cannabis products. Yeah. We're not talking about hemp right now. Um, if it was hemp, you know, you could cross state lines potentially with with with, with products, um, but no, no crossing state lines with with with, can with cannabis products right now. Hopefully, we'll get there sooner than later, uh, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, sorry. There's a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, we're going to try to, you know, address those organically. Hopefully we'll have some more time at the end. But for everyone tuning in, I see your questions. Um, I just kind of want to make sure we get through. We're about halfway finished with our time already. So I just want to make sure we get through our content and then we'll address as many questions of yours as we can. OK, um, cool. So I think, team, unless anyone has any other thoughts on the similarities, you know, I think it's an appropriate time here. Just looking at the clock, you know, we can now spend sort of. Uh, you know, another uh, like 15, 20 minutes here on, on differences, um, mm -hmm. you know, b between the license types and then, um, you know, go into best practices. So let's let's discuss some differences um, that, that are meaningful. Um, you know, how about we start with, you know, there was a social equity question and that's. A yeah, I saw topic. That, yeah. So let, let's let, let's talk about social equity um, first. Um, so maybe you know, team, I'll, I'll kind of defer to you individually. It might make sense to provide sort of a, a high level overview of, of what we're seeing in, in these specific state markets regarding how the regulators are treating social equity. Um, and we can kind of identify the differences um, after that overview, if that makes sense. Sure, I, we, we can start. Um, cool. You know, it's social equity um, is personal to every locality. Right. So every state gets to decide whether they want to implement social equity and what the requirements will be. Um, and I guess the, the state piece of it is that um, 
you know, cities that do implement a social equity pr program can apply for funding from the state. So, which that was just released, right? Like, what, and we got... I believe what, so. What did, yeah. LA, what did LA get? Yeah, the state, at least this first iteration, there was $10 million available. Yeah, which they then kind of um, disseminate to to their social equity components. But, you know, we, we've seen, you know, there will be certain cities... Um, I, I don't know, I was just thinking about Culver City, for example, and, and their licensing licensing process was several years ago, but, you know, no social equity component at all. But then you'll see um, cities like L.A., Long Beach, Oakland, who have, um, you know, either a straight ownership requirement. So if you want to license the social equity, social equity applicant has to have 51 percent ownership or you'll see something more like and that's how L.A. L.A. works to a certain extent. But then you'll see cities like Long Beach, which is more, um, I would say, robust in that it's like if you want a license, you have to create a social equity plan. And it's like, what are you going to do to help the social equity um, operators in your city? And so it'd be like something if you have, um, you know, if you have someone who's a licensing specialist on your team, then maybe you you volunteer 10 hours a year to help a social equity applicant apply for a license or something like that. I don't know if that's one that that's great. No, and one thing I, I do want to say, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful more municipalities and more states, as as you know, kind of do dominoes continue to fall and more states continue to to legalize, really follow, you know, a Long Beach path compared to a city of LA path. Yeah. You know, one of the challenges to sort of the, the 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 limited ownership threshold. Look, the intention is great, right? We're we're this industry stands on the shoulders of of people who have risked life, liberty, property, you know, for this plant. Um, and the war has the war on drugs has obviously disproportionately affected people of color dramatically more than 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 uh, you know people uh, not of color. So we're totally in agreement there. The challenge is you know if you have a minimum uh, th threshold of ownership requirement, right, and that can't be diluted. How many large businesses do we work with? Um, where you have one person who owns 51% of that business and it and never dilutes below that. There aren't too many, you know, so, so the opportunity when I talk to a lot of our clients who are interested in participating in social equity programs, their hesitation is because how are we supposed to fundraise for this business, right? If we continue to, to dilute, but we bring in, you know, money to, to grow and capitalize this business, but the social equity applicant can never dilute, I would rather have 10% of a $5 million business than 51% of a $500,000 business, sure. right? Um, and so that, that's something that, that I'm hoping, you know, more municipalities really start to understand um, and, and really take lessons learned um, from what's already happening. I mean, somewhat yet to be determined. And uh, David, Tim, Jen, sorry to step on toes there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make, have, make that, that point. Yeah. No, yeah. it's a great point. Like, so in both New York and New Jersey, they have really actually pretty far reaching social equity programs written into the laws. And then it's up to the regulators to give those teeth and to come up with regulations, how it's actually going to, to work in practice. In New Jersey, there is 30% um, of licenses need to go to businesses that are owned by minorities, women, or disabled veterans. Um, in New York, it's 50% of uh, licenses are supposed to go to social equity applicants. Wow. The problem, the problem with New York's program is it's not entirely clear who will qualify as a social equity applicant. Like it, there is language in there, of like focusing on folks that have actually been affected by the drug war, or like have been imprisoned or have family members that have been imprisoned. But the most clear path to qualifying is getting a certification as a minority or a woman owned business. And that runs into the problem that Jeff, you were just make, mentioning, which is that you need to own 51% of a business to qualify. And these businesses usually are not indirectly owned by individuals, they're directly owned, which means that you can't like put together a more tax beneficial structure for it. And it really does um, limit the ability of minority and women owned own businesses, veteran owned businesses to, to scale and grow. And it's tough. Another one is the micro business in New Jersey, which is not a vertical license. It's just an individual license. You can't sell, sell or transfer them. Over time, you could convert them into a regular annual license and those can be sold or transferred. But as long as it's a micro business, 
there are these restrictions on sale that like make it a lot harder, which is not ideal. I get the, the goal, but it's tough. Sure. Wow. Sure. Um, Dave, David or Tim, did you guys have anything um, specific to uh, mass, how, how Mass has been approaching uh, social equity that's similar or different from, from these other states? Tim, why don't you go ahead and I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, so at least in Massachusetts, the state level, um, you know, there are economic empowerment applicants and there are social equity program participants, which are sort of their own different designations that the state gives out. Um, and they have their own benefits in terms of sort of uh, priority review of applications, reduced license fees, reduced, you know, application fees, like that kind of thing. Um, now, if you wanted to maintain that status, then they have to have, you know, majority ownership uh, of those licenses and maintain that. Like, they still have the flexibility, technically, to, you know, divest themselves of, of that interest, but then they, like, lose that status, basically. Um, I would also add that, you know, for social equity program participants and economic power and applicants, uh, there's a um, priority given to them for uh, courier applications and also uh, we have like delivery operators as well. Um, and there's an exclusivity period for those licenses for three yeah. years um, f um, once the first one begins to operate basically. Uh, my understanding is that the first courier license was given a final license today, uh, I believe, in the public hearing of the commission. So. Uh, we're going to see that clock start soon as far as a three-year exclusivity period is concerned with those license types. Um, you know, at the municipal level, as far as, like, social equity uh, applicants is concerned, uh, some uh, municipalities have kind of developed their own processes for those and have, like, said that X number of licenses go to these type of applicants and that kind of thing. But that's going to be specific to each municipality anyway. David, I don't know if you have anything else to add. But. No, that, was, that was perfect, yeah. No, I, would, I, would just, I would just add that um, this is a, a major point of emphasis for the commission, and they're very concerned about trying to, to make um, you know, some of these benefits really meaningful. Um, the exclusivity period for delivery and social consumption for the first three years for social equity is, is supposed to be a, a massive benefit, and there was some, there was some pushback um, by various operators, particularly retailers, um, but it is continuing to, to plow ahead, and um, it, it's something that I think the commission is going to do as, as best they can to try to protect in terms of um, some larger companies coming in and trying to potentially take um, you know, certain, certain ownership positions in these applicants. So it, it's going to be um, something that we'll always have to sort of cautiously look at to make sure that um, we don't inadvertently have uh, an equity applicant kind of lose their status um, as a result of trying to, to fundraise or or, um, you know, get to where they actually are able to commence operations. So um, a good program, but um, definitely somewhat somewhat complicated in terms of making sure it, it actually works the way it's meant to meant to do. Great. Thank you, everyone. Go ahead, Jen. Piggyback on mm -hmm. that on that one. Um, so I just want to address a couple of things in the, in the chat. So you don't have to um, do you have to have a social equity program to open in New Jersey? You don't actually have to be a social equity applicant to get a license in New Jersey. Um, and these this target of 30%, that's a target in the law. It's really up to the commission to come up with a way to make that happen and to figure out how it's going to work. There's also targets of like a certain percentage of licenses need to go to impact zones, which are designated as areas that have higher proportion of cannabis arrests. So right. we really just need to see how this actually looks in practice. There's also what um, David and Tim were just talking about what from Massachusetts, um, which is these, and also like what you're describing for, for California, honestly, like is individual municipalities, larger cities are going to have their own social equity programs. They just right. are. Like I don't, like I, my hometown of Newark, I just don't see it not having a program where they want to make sure that a certain number of social equity applicants and locals get licenses. Mm -hmm. It's just that those ordinances haven't come out yet. It's still in its infancy. I'm done. Great. No, 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 that was wonderful. I <laughs> uh, loved it. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, let's, let's pivot here. Looking at the time. Let's pivot here to what do you think, guys? CEQA compliance or uh, th this, um, you know, sort of host community agreement requirement? What should we, what should we tell? I defer to you guys. What's, what's uh, I, I more wanted exciting? to, I don't know if we have time for this, but just, I, I don't know. And I don't know if we maybe have already discussed this a bit, but no. 
just the difference, you know, in, in just the basic licensing, like, you know, that in California, it's a local and a state, like a dual permit uh, system. I, I just think that's like such an important distinction that maybe, and also I is. don't want to talk about CEQA. <laughs> yeah, we were, all right, we're scratching CEQA. Uh, Jen, Dave, uh, David, Tim, is is there a local and a state requirement in 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 the states you focus on too, or is it just one permit? So uh, in Massachusetts, um, in order to be able to submit an application to the state, you have to enter into what's called a host community agreement, which I believe uh -huh. we touched on earlier. Right. The municipality okay. can come up with its own process for how it decides uh, which which operators or which applicants um, are able to enter into the host community agreement. But until you have that agreement signed and then hold a, a local community outreach meeting, you will not be eligible to submit uh, a state license application. Okay. Um, once you submit a state license application, the commission will contact the municipality where your facility is going to be located just to confirm that you do in fact have a host community agreement and that your facility is sort of generally in compliance with uh, local zoning bylaws and local ordinances. Now, separate and apart from that state piece, the municipality also may have its own separate special permits, uh, its own yeah. kind of local local permits, operating permit process that are specific for cannabis businesses. Like um, a merit, kind of, sorry, like a merit, yeah. some will be merit and some will be um, not non-competitive kind of a thing? Yeah, the, to, the, to, to get the host community agreement, that often is a, a very competitive process just because there's a, a lot of people, right. there's only a certain number of sort of retailer licenses that might be available in that municipality. Um, but for the things like special permits, um, those are typically not competitive processes. And it's really just to make sure that your facility is in compliance with local zoning bylaws in terms of how close they are to a school and, and how close they are to another establishment and, and that type of thing. So um, it's more of a competitive process sort of on the front end in terms of the local municipality. Wonderful. Thank um, you. Go ahead, Jen. So basics, well, I'm covering two very different states here, fairly different. So starting with New Jersey, there is a um, state level application. Um, license application should not be competitive at the state level outside of cultivation. Cultivation for the first two years, as long as that license cap is in place, um, it will be competitive at the state level. Um, the goal is that the others will, will not be as long as you satisfy all the requirements. At the local level, some licenses will be competitive. They just will because municipalities have the right to impose their own local licensing. No, no municipalities in New Jersey that I'm aware of have done so yet. They're starting to pass ordinances, but I haven't seen a local licensing ordinance yet. It's coming though. Um, they also have to approve any type, any application that is submitted to the state. The municipality needs to sign off on it. So New Jersey, I think that we're going to see something very similar to Massachusetts in terms of both host community agreements, um, additional fees tied to local licensing, and also just, especially for retail or consumption lounges, I think those are going to be competitive bids in, in some municipalities, they just will. New York, on the other hand, is um, just released a fact sheet today, actually. Um, our clients are going to be getting emails later today with the links, <laughs> links to these fact sheets. Nice. It's on my agenda for the rest of the day. Um, of saying there will be no local licensing. And this repeats something that the DOH has told us before repeatedly. They do not oh. want local licensing. Um, this is something that it can only be done at the state level. Municipalities can regulate time, place, and manner for retail, but I, this, I don't see a way that Williamsburg or Brooklyn as a whole can cap the number of dispensaries. It's basically going to yeah. come down to, can you find a property that is zoned correctly? Yeah. Right. That is an adequate distance from schools and from places of worship, which are the two markers set out in the law. But I mean, you could also then have further local regulation on that. So we're really going to have to see how this works in, in place, but in cultivation in New York, no, no local licensing and no local caps. Very interesting. I mean, that's yeah. gonna be wild. Um, yeah, it's a big state. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
You know what? Jen hit on something that I want to chat about. Let's talk about consumption lounges. You know, we yeah. work with some consumption businesses here in California um, that we we're very honored to work with. Um, uh, Emily, let, let's let's start with California here, if we don't mind. Emily, um, yeah. Amanda, can you kind of break down um, where consumption is at in, in California? Yeah, not too many places. <laughs> not too uh, many. There's, there's, there's not a lot. There's not a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I think there's only a few that are probably actually operational. Um, San Francisco allows it, um, yep. and West Hollywood allows it, and West Hollywood had a very, very, very competitive process to to give out those consumption lounges. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with COVID, um, none of them have been open um, <laughs> recently. Um, but but um, but yeah, they're uh, it, it, they're very cool. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, I Palm believe. Springs allows it too. Palm Springs, yeah, and and honestly, I think we're seeing cities in California start to more cities start to experiment yeah. with those kinds of licenses, um, and I think we will see um, them be competitive as well. But there's there's um, some interesting health restrictions in California, and and that can kind of limit the. Um, uses at a consumption yeah. lounge, and I think people have really high hopes, you know, to serve food and to have music and to you know, a whole like interactive experience. Exactly, and and I think we're going to see the evolution of that play out. But um, there's definitely been some creative solutions in, <laughs> for the in West Hollywood in particular, and for the other consumption lounges in the state. Yeah, and I'll say too, like for West Hollywood, you know, I thought was interesting is they had different tiers of consumption lounges, right? Yeah. So. Some were, you, you know, you could actually go in and smoke, and others were edibles only. I think those two right. versions. Yeah. Edibles, um, and it, and there was like a topicals, even like a topicals only, I believe. Well, like there was for, one for spas. Oh, for like a spa uh, model. That's I believe. cool. Yeah, um, and but most Hollywood intend to not consume there, and then you're like, then it's sort of the the line of. Um, it's, is it a consumption lounge or is it a retailer? And it's been super right. controversial because the retailers are like, if you allow the consumption lounges to take away and basically give them that almost like retailer, um, you know, oper operation, mm -hmm. then it decreases the value of our of our retail storefront. Because why would I just go to a retail storefront when I could go to something that's a retail storefront and a consumption lounge. So it's right. It's and been, also have dinner. And also, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the munchies. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and I, I think, you know, uh, as we continue to sort of evolve here and as, you know, acceptance continues to, to grow and we continue to normalize and destigmatize, um, yeah. we're, we're going to start mm -hmm. seeing more and more of those, um, you know, sort of pop up. So, Curious, uh, everyone else, what, what's 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 going on yeah. consumption wise in uh, in Massachusetts, Jersey, New York? Consumption lounge wise, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I mean, right now in Massachusetts, there's no license type available. Okay. To okay. Uh, it's contemplated in the law and the regulations that eventually that those license types will open up. Uh, I don't think there's really been an appetite to tackle that. <laughs> As of yet, I think there's probably sort of like a wait and see approach by the commission sure. as far as even just like these delivery licenses are concerned and rolling those out and making sure that that program is successful. Uh, but, you know, consumption license is not currently available. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see some more movement on that in the coming year. Um, but, you know, nothing like currently happening, really. And sure. in caution, like... I don't think even when they do get become operational, I don't think they're going to look the way that people think that they're going to look. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah. what do you mean? It's uh, in terms of like what you're actually able to do on the premises. Uh, Got it. You know, we'll, we'll see. Hopeful. <laughs> and the idea, um, like Tim said, there's no actual kind of licenses being issued for those. I think the idea is to have a, a sort of preliminary pilot program where I think up to 12 municipalities can kind of opt in to be the, the guinea pigs here. Um, but my understanding is that even that opt-in process will require um, a fix from the legislature. So um, it's, that's, you know, with the, with the pandemic and, and everything, it's not, has not been a, a major priority for the legislature at this time. So um, I do think it's gonna, it's gonna be a little bit of time before we get that up and going. And again, keep in mind, um, these social consumption licenses would be would be limited to economic empowerment and social equity um, program people. So 
um, it'll be interesting. I think it's going to be great, but I think it. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hold your breath. It's, it's going to happen. Come, come see soon. us. We'll we'll take you. We'll take you out. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, um, I would say both New York and New Jersey, like their laws contemplate uh, consumption licenses that um, would be tied to some sort of retail establishment. In New Jersey, it's part of the retail license. Okay. In New York, it's a separate license um, that can be held concurrently with retail. But it's um, it's just hard to say what this will look like in practice. Like we, we just don't know. And there's definitely a lot of interest, like especially like sort of spa concept, spa plus consumption lounge. Mm -hmm. But right, I don't know. It's really hard the to spa thing is kind of cool. Yeah, that's, I mean that's what I would I'm be down. most I'm so interested in. Aimed at us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A spa with a you know THC infused you know massage yeah. that that yeah. would be exceptional. Um, all right, so we've got a little over 10 minutes left. Um, I'd like to open up for questions, but first, Jen, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of spotlight you a minute here with a couple questions I have um, for Jersey and New York specifically. Um, so as, you know, how long do you think it's going to be before we see adult sales in, in, in Jersey and New York? I know, I know you're getting flooded with, you know, interest here um, in these programs. And, you know, we're, we're incredibly lucky to have such a, you know, su such a knowledgeable resource here. So figured I'd ask the question that I'm sure you're being asked every day. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, asked a lot. Um, okay, New <laughs> Jersey, there is a timeline in the law, which is fantastic. Regulations are coming out um, by August 22nd. That is the that's six Ooh. months after the day the law was passed. Applications are supposed to, uh, the commission, which has now been formed and is meeting, the commission is supposed to start um, receiving and reviewing applications within 30 days of the regulations. So if they get them out by August 22nd, they need to start accepting applications by September 22nd. Now I could see there being some delay in those regulations coming out, like maybe after Labor Day, but I do know that the commission is working really hard to meet that deadline and they do sure. take this seriously. Also because New York and New Jersey are in a um, very competitive race <laughs> to see who can get this done first. Right. New Jersey had the head start, um, but wasn't expecting New York honestly to legalize this year. And so it just makes a big difference in building up the market because the, the borders between these states and movement of people is just so porous. Like I'm in a part of, I live in New Jersey, but the part of New Jersey that is a <laughs> suburb of New York, that's it. Sure. sure. New York, looking at that, um, the there is no timeline in the law for when regulations will come out or when licenses will come out. However, the most recent guidance we've received from the Department of Health is that adult use licenses should start coming out um, within 18 months of the law's passage. That would be August, I'm sorry, that would be October of 2022. So if licenses start coming out in October of next year, you would think applications will be coming out sometime in spring, summer of 2022. Now, this is just for new businesses that are applying for adult use. It doesn't consider the current medical operators, which are grandfathered into both states' programs. Oh, cool. In New Jersey, our 12 ATCs, our vertically integrated medical operators, can actually start switching to adult sa adult use sales as early as August of this year, provided they satisfy the commission, that they have enough product on hand to satisfy both the medical population and the adult use population. Also, they need to get municipal approval. In New York, the registered organizations, the 10 of them also vertically integrated, can switch over to adult use sales. The parameters for that are a little different. There is a one-time fee to make that change. But in terms of timing, they'll certainly be the first ones to be making those sales. But the timeline, the expectation is it'll be sometime next year. Great. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, wait, so, you know, in, in California, the adult and medical my market are basically collapsed, right? And, and there's really no, there's, I think except for like the edibles, I think there's no, really no except or difference. What's the difference between adult and medical? Is it just that how much you can take away in a day or what, or is the, are the products different? Huh. It's very hard to say what it'll be here. In <laughs> both states, it's going to be, do you have a medical card? Have you been able to get it? It's harder to get a medical card in New York than it is in New Jersey. The number of conditions has been 
hugely expanded in New Jersey to the point where like 1% of the population right now is a medical patient, which is honestly not terrible for a medical program. Um, also medical, the ATC's cultivator or retailers in New Jersey will be able to have their own consumption lounges. So it's not really Ooh. clear how different it'll be. Medical operators yeah. also will be, um, medical patients are, the sales tax is being phased out for them in New Jersey. So even though it's a fairly low sales tax on adult use scales in Jersey, it's only our sales tax plus like 2% to the municipality per, per license type. Yeah, that's really low. It's very low. Whereas New York, it's uh, the effective rate is a bit higher. So I also don't know if New York is going to phase out taxes for medical patients. So it's really hard to say. Sure. Then um, Massachusetts, I know the medical program in some ways, didn't it expand in recent years? Because I know adult use came into effect, but a lot of people recently have been getting their medical cards. <laughs> yeah, we've seen a huge explosion over the past year in terms of medical registrations, uh, where I think last year before the pandemic, there was something like 60,000 patients, and now we're more like 100,000 patients across the state. Wow. Um, yeah, part true. of that is because, you know, adult use operators were shut down for a period of time and medical operators weren't. Uh, there's also some difference in the concentrations in terms of the products that you can get. Uh, no taxes and another thing. And also just delivery from medical marijuana treatment centers to patients uh, is another benefit where that isn't the case for adult use until hopefully very soon. So there's, there's a number of reasons why it's advantageous to be a patient in Massachusetts. And so we've seen people take better advantage of that during the pandemic than they had. Previously. Yeah, because adult use was shut down for COVID, but medical was allowed to. So uh, yeah. in, in California, all because of our kind of collapsed market, everything got to stay open, which was which was lucky for us <laughs> and our yeah. clients. Yeah, um, so we uh, we. We, we did try. Uh, through, through the <laughs> I'm course. sure you did, Dave. <laughs> we, we did. We had a, a valiant attempt to try to to try to keep recreational um, stores open, and the judge did say, you know, we made some compelling arguments, but a lot of deference was given to yeah. the governor during, you know, for public health reasons during the pandemic. So, um, but eventually they were able to open up again. So. But we did try. <laughs> Great, um, Jen. Quick follow up. I know, uh, you know, we've got a lot of people interested. What should clients do right now? Potential clients who are interested in Jersey, New York. Is there a wait and see approach? Should they reach out to you? Make sure they get on our, you know, email list. You know, what, what is there anything they can do right now? What, you know, what, if anything, should they be doing? There's a lot to be doing. Um, I would say always get in touch with right. us. <laughs> right. If not us, another <laughs> lawyer. Like you do need to talk to someone <laughs> yeah, okay. right. later, especially for New Jersey. Um, let me start with New York because it's a longer lead time. For New sure. York, it's a matter of waiting until you start to see what towns are going to be open to retail. That's that's a big part of it. And they have through the end of the year to do that. Um, if you are a if your company is a minority female, uh, service disabled veteran or distressed farmer owned business, then there are steps oh. you could take to make sure you form your entity and like you you start start some uh, business operations and hopefully try to get a certification from the state for, for one of those groups. That That is something you can do now. Also looking for properties. That is always something and also building up your team. Um, we offer our clients a lot of resources in terms of like updates from what um, the, the Department of Health and is saying and also um, just to, there are also updates in terms of like what the towns are deciding. In New Jersey, you absolutely need to get started if you want to be, if you want, are looking to apply later this year. That comes down to figure out where you're going to operate. If you are going to open a macro business, which in New Jersey is not a vertically integrated license, you um, are limited to where you live mm. or one of the surrounding towns. There are so many rules like that. So you want to start making local connections. You want to start obviously building your your team scoping out properties like if you are a uh, one of those groups if you try to get the certification so there's a lot of um there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid especially if you're going for one of the more competitive license types fantastic thank you jen um all right we've got five minutes um before i sort of kind of peel through the the questions here 
anyone on the panel here, did, does anyone have any kind of closing last thoughts? Um, I'm going to start looking through the questions. Feel free to, yeah. to chime in um, if you've got any thoughts, considerations, any, anything for um, all the lovely people who are tuned in to us right now. I'm ready for questions. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Uh, okay. So one, uh, I guess, Jen, for you, does New Jersey still have the 10% THC limit on medical? Do you know that? I am not sure that they do. I'm not sure okay. if that's been lifted. So I'd want to look into it, actually. But feel okay. free to message me directly, anybody. Our, our emails Great. will be on the last slide. Great. Um, Gary Stein, you have a question about Florida. We're not really covering Florida in this panel. Uh, reach out to us. We do have uh, a Florida office, so we can certainly help. Um, one of our colleagues, Sally Kent Peebles, uh, runs our, our Florida office. Can definitely help there, um, but we're not we're not uh, focused on that uh, today. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, question from Stephen Konisberg. Uh, surely no alcohol in consumption lounges. Correct. Uh, but if you hold a state liquor license, are you barred from holding any cannabis licenses? Um, I'm not sure that you are. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure for certainly for, for Jersey or New York, Jen, I would defer to you. I know that was a big issue in Nevada, right? Um, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, if you own or you have an, even an interest, not an outright ownership interest, but any interest in a gaming license, um, gaming or alcohol meant you were prevented from um, having an ownership interest in cannabis. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, okay. Another one. Oh, this is a fun question. Uh, for new licensing, how are clones obtained if the state has never seen legalization before? <laughs> it's, mag it's magic. It's magic. Uh, yeah. No, it's the, the, the immaculate the conception. The immaculate conception right. moment, yeah. or I have a funny story about a client who was building out a cultivation facility in Hawaii, and the local regulators asked the same question. And apparently, the operator, which got a bunch of laughs, which was great, said that the that, that the birds flew over and just <laughs> dropped the seeds into the ground. Um, <laughs> So the answer is there's 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 usually there has to be a tacit acknowledgement on the regulator's side. Um, it's a chicken egg immaculate conception yeah. question. How did it get there? Well, you know, we all are mindful that there was plenty of unlicensed activity before there was licensed activity. And that's the reality of how it got there. Um, so but but good question. Um, you know, certainly if a state does have, if this is, you know, pre, pre licensure, um, you know, you, you can't do that. But if it's a state where you're about to be licensed, you know, hopefully there's a way you can purchase seeds or clones legally. Um, if not, it, uh, <laughs> that's the reality of how seeds got there in the first place is, is magic. <laughs> um, so, um, look, that, that just about ends our time. Nice to end on a, on a light note here. Um, everyone watching, look, I just really wanted to emphasize the people that I'm mm -hmm. speaking to right now are absolute thought leaders in our space. Um, I know I didn't cover everyone's questions. We jam, tried to jam as much information as possible into an hour here. Um, if you have additional questions, look, we're, the, we're a nice group of people. We're happy to talk to you anytime. <laughs> Please feel free to reach out. Um, and I'm, I'm humbled uh, that so many people uh, tuned in today. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, David, Jen. Tim, Emily, Amanda, I appreciate you all so much. Um, and I had a blast today. So um, thanks again to everyone. Um, and we'll talk to you soon. Reach out with any questions or thoughts. Thanks, Jeff.